Welcome to the Core Volunteer Training, a program that was created to help our supporters in CCL, especially newer volunteers, uh, connect with each other around a larger world and empower them to achieve their larger goals for climate advocacy. So tonight's topic is communicating with conservatives. Tonight's talk, we're gonna have three main points. Uh, the, the first point um, that you'll hopefully, um, that will, will come across through tonight is that conservatives and the liberals rely on different sets of core values when they're evaluating what's acceptable behavior, what is, what is acceptable for them to do. A second point is that successful presentations and successful discussions with people that you run into um, over coffee or across a fence in your backyard, focus on the audience's values that that, that that successful presentation can be really crafted around your audience's values. And the third point that we'll touch on at the end is that there are resources to help with this um, outreaching um, to conservatives on, online, and we'll share where some of those are. And I do want to start with one ground rule. Um, just I ask that you assume the best in intentions of everyone during our talk tonight as we're talking about um, political affiliation and what progressives think, what conservatives think, left, right. Sometimes uh, we, I use words that might push your button and it's not my intent. Uh, but when we're talking in a politically divided country about the politics of the country, um, oftentimes we can, we can bump into emotional issues and just assume the best intentions uh, throughout, throughout our conversation. So I am, I am the uh, Conservative Outreach Director in Citizens Climate Lobby. I had a, have a background in, in, uh, in environmental cleanups. I had a career doing environmental cleanups uh, with a background in, in geochemistry and uh, left my job to try and be, uh, have a voice in uh, moving our country forward on climate policies about six years ago. Took about a year to find Citizens Climate Lobby. Um, and uh, have now been active with Citizens Climate Lobby for, for five years and uh, on staff for about a year and a half now trying to help us focus on our outreach to conservatives across the country and, and, and find good ways to, to do that. Our agenda tonight is going to have five main pieces. We're going to talk a little bit about conservative values, like what are those? What do we mean when we say conservatives have different values than liberals? And we're going to rely on Jonathan Haidt's work. We're going to then talk about how these, this, these differences in values relate to our discussions on, on carbon dividends, on HR 763, and, and on climate policy in general. We're going to have a, a short group discussion. Then we're going to go through some resources on community and make sure we have time at the end for some uh, question and answer and discussion as a group. So let's dive right in. The structure that I like to use for talking about conservative values is, is work by Jonathan Haidt, um, who is a researcher who has spent time um, <coughs> looking at um, how different people evaluate what is acceptable behavior um, in cultures across the world um, and um, has, has kind of taken that to a, uh, an additional level by querying people on their political affiliations um, in cultures across the world and really differentiating, um, coming to the realization that people that consider themselves more conservative, not just in the United States, but more conservative across the world, tend to rely on a little bit different suite of, uh, of five core values. So, so Jonathan Haidt has created this, this idea that he calls moral foundations theory and morals just being what we consider when we're evaluating what's appropriate for us to do and foundation like what's uh, the bedrock of, of, of the ideas that we, we consider when we're evaluating what's appropriate behavior. And it's come with, uh, with these, um, he usually uses five dimensions. Sometimes you'll see him write about a sixth dimension that I just want to walk through. So these are things that we, people in general, consider when they're evaluating what's right and wrong, what's right and appropriate to do. One is, is it harm somebody? Um, or does it care for somebody? If it harms some, somebody, uh, we generally uh, agree it's not appropriate to do. A second one, is it fair? Um, so I may not want to harm people. I may, I may hold firmly that we can't harm anybody else. Like I couldn't just go take away your car or, or lock you up. Um, however, if you're caught drunk driving for a second offense, um, I may think it's perfectly okay for our government to collectively lock you up and take away your car. Um, there's a fairness component in, in all these different uh, uh, evaluations can compete with each other and, and even seem seemingly contradict in certain cases. Um, so harm and care, fairness, a third dimension that we consider when we're evaluating whether something's right for us to do is in-group loyalty. 
and with the opposite of that being betrayal, uh, where we where we do things differently for people that we are loyal to. Um, and, and, and if you've ever watched your spouse or anybody else deal with their family, you know that, you know that all of us have this at some level. Another dimension is authority versus subversion, um, which relates to obeying both tradition and legitimate authority. Um, and this, this stems right out of, you know, you can go back in childhood when, when my dad told me to eat my peas. I ate my peas. It also varies through time. If my dad told me today to eat my peas, it might be an interesting conversation, but it might not have the same end. It might relate in the, to a conversation than just me eating my peas. Another dimension is purity, uh, where what is pure and sacred, uh, and if we degrade those, there's a degradation component on the other end that some people uh, consider when they're evaluating what is appropriate behavior. And a sixth one we're not gonna talk about tonight as much is is uh, liberty versus oppression with the with with, with concept of, of uh, loathing tyranny. Um, so Jonathan Haidt took this a little further. I wanna explain the graph that I just brought up on the um, left hand, on the up-down scale, the, the vertical axis, uh, there's a five, five numbered scale where at the top, um, the top of this is people, is, is people saying, hey, this dimension is, I strongly agree that this is relevant. Um, that black line in the middle is just, yeah, it's kind of neutral. And down at the bottom is people saying, no, I do not consider this dimension relevant. I think this is not relevant. And along the bottom axis of this, he's categorized um, data on people that, ha that have identified themselves as, as, or have been identified through some of his questions as strongly liberal, moderately liberal, slightly liberal, neutral, to the same slightly conservative, moderately conservative, and strongly conservative. And what he's found, across multiple cultures is that people that identify themselves as more liberal um, tend to focus on does it harm somebody and is it and is it fair those are the those are the moral dimensions that they think are most relevant um, and i've even had somebody while i was talking to them about this say in group loyalty nothing good ever came from that um, there are people that really think that these the other dimensions evaluating whether something's pure and sacred or or whether you're degrading something and authority get in the way of, of good discussions about are you harming people and is it fair? As you move to the conservative side, oops, so I'm gonna, so those are the dimensions that people that are more, more liberal or progressive in our society um, rely on more heavily when they're evaluating what is acceptable behavior. And this is um, in bulk average. So this is not saying every person that identifies them over there or that everybody splits out this evenly. Um, as we shift over and look at people that call themselves more conservative or classify themselves as more conservative, they tend to rely on authority, purity, and group loyalty also. Um, the harm and fairness dimensions are down, it are not as important. They're still important for them. It's not that people uh, who consider themselves uh, conservative think it's just okay to go harm somebody. Um, but they, the, those dimensions are weighted in a, in a broader mix of values that they use when they're evaluating what is appropriate behavior. I, I want to take a little bit of time and, and kind of unwrap this and say, so, so this is really interesting work. Um, Jonathan Haidt, you can watch him on, on YouTube. He's done a bunch of talks. Um, Oh, I also should have brought the book over. He's, he's also written a, a good book on exactly this subject. But I want to take a little bit of time on the three dimensions that conservatives are more likely to use when they're evaluating what's acceptable behavior and, and dig into that a little bit and, and talk specifically about how does it relate to us going out and talking about climate policy. So I'm going to, to start with, I'm going to talk about in-group loyalty and, and how that uh, relates to speaking to conservatives. Recognizing that conservatives um, consider in-group loyalty um, more stronger than, than most people that, are, that would identify themselves as progressive or liberal. A really just fundamental piece in this is that we often display our loyalties uh, without really recognizing it, both in the examples we bring up, in the people we quote, um, as well as even in our slide deck. Um, so I know, that, uh, like we, I think it was just this last weekend, there was a climate reality training, a very large one in Atlanta that I know a bunch of, have a bunch of friends that went and attended. And if you walk into a conservative audience with your climate reality slide deck, 
um, you have to recognize that what you are saying to them is that I am loyal to the Democratic Vice President of the United States who ran against the Republican to become the President of the United States. Um, and that you're expressing that in the choice of the logo that you have on the bottom of your slides. I am not in this in this saying that those slides are not, that the content is not appropriate or that the 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 the, the content is wrong in any way. But what I'm expressing here is that if you are speaking to a conservative audience, recognize um, which parts of your loyalty you may be expressing to them or even kind of make, giving them proofs that you are loyal to different groups than they are. And you may instead want to, want to the bottom picture here, take as, as an example, some quotes from James Baker and George Schultz who were, who were speaking to President Reagan there and use some quotes from Baker and Schultz uh, and, and you maybe um, go back to source material if, if you're looking for a slide that presents CO2 over time, find something from NOAA or NASA and not have something with a green circle on the earth on the bottom that's saying, I, I, I really want to tell you that Vice President Gore uh, is really the person you should be listening to on this subject. It also plays out in, in how you present what you're concerned about. Why, are, why is it that we need to address this? Um, so, so it is okay to play a harm card here, that people get hurt by this. This will hurt the economy, this will hurt people's jobs, it will hurt people. When you're speaking to people that value in group loyalty, it is better to speak to people in their group that are going to get hurt. It is better to speak to people that, that are in their circle of concern. So instead of speaking of the people in Bangladesh um, or the, the people in, in Africa that just got uh, uh, hit by a, a very strong cyclone, um, speak about the flooding in Houston. Here in Asheville, I can speak about the flooding in Fayetteville. We're, um, we're in, in the lower parts of, of North Carolina. We've had two 1,000 year flood events in the course of two years. So find your local audience and talk about the local impacts. Um, it, it really is important to know your local impacts of climate change. Are you a little warmer than average or a little wetter, a little drier? What's been happening recently? Having some local statistics for the audience you're talking about can be really important. I, this is not about ignoring international concerns. Um, so this sequence of three photos I'm going to show here, I just presented to our local Chamber of Commerce. We got an opportunity to present to a, about 35 people on our local Chamber of Commerce's policy committee this last week. And I presented our local impacts first, some flooding in Asheville, some landslides that happen with increased rain, some forest fires that happen around here when it gets too dry, when it's hot. Um, and I wanted to bring in international pieces. Uh, but I did it from a perspective of relating these back to their values, what they're concerned about. So um, the, this picture is, is from uh, uh, is extremely severe storm north of Germany that just happened this year. And uh, this is a container ship where 200, the storm was so severe that it rocked the boat so hard it knocked 200, over 200 of the, of the containers on this container ship off the ship. And as you can see in the photo, damaged some more. Um, and I tied it back into their businesses by saying, so this climate change around the world will impact your supply chain, your ability to get your products to other places, your ability to get products, uh, materials that you rely on it to your business. Um, this is a picture of a Honda plant in Thailand where they had sig significant flooding in 2011. It closed down 200 manufacturing plants like this. Um, and for, for our local businesses that do international business, um, their supply chains are impacted and their ability to get uh, materials are impacted through this type of, of impact. And uh, also, so up in the mountains of Western North Carolina, we do not deal with sea level change, but I, I brought it into the discussion um, through a picture of, the, uh, in, of Miami. Um, Flooding in, along the coastal states impacts our regional economy that we really depend on for tourists here as well as for our business. The, the migrations of people will affect people inland from the, the coastal economy and will affect our economy here. So I'm not speaking about ignoring international issues, um, but, but everything that you bring up, you need to relate to something in group or in the group uh, that you're, for the values of the group you're, you're talking to. Um, so, so on each of these three optic items, I have a slide with a couple of links that you can, you can pop up later. Um, these are some, some links that might help you find resources for talking about local impacts as well as some 
quotes from conservatives for giving people messages um, from an, from inside their group as opposed to having all your messaging and quotes rely on on people from outside their group. A second dimension so that's the, that I wanted to talk through is authority versus subversion. So so conservatives uh, on average think that evaluating people in uh, positions of authority, legitimate people positions of authority is very relevant when they're considering what's appropriate behavior. And progressives uh, tend to think that's less important. And the two pictures here relate right into climate. Uh, the top is uh, our National Guard at the border, at the south border of the United States. Uh, recent recent issue, recent recent picture, and the bottom is the yellow vested uh, uh, demonstrations over in France um, that that you hear messaged from the right because it plays into this authority versus subversion uh, messaging uh, that you need to be very careful on how you are you are messaging and, and consider if you are triggering authority subversion uh, responses in your audience. An example I would I would give uh, that I've seen that I that I uh, if you are speaking to a conservative audience and you have a, a really motivational clip from somebody that is organizing people skipping schools on Friday to uh, protest climate change that may not be the best start for a for a climate uh, talk to a group of conservatives it may not convince them that you have the same values that they do. So considering, consider that as you evaluate how you are going about a dialogue with conservatives, what, what you're bringing into those conversations. And again, the conservative quotes one is a good, we also have some good press releases uh, regarding, uh, this is, there's a link there for some press releases regarding conservatives that have been in the news making statements about climate change. There, there have been a number of Republican members in Congress that have made some very um, solid statements on climate change lately that you can use. And the, the third dimension I want to talk a little bit about uh, while, we're look, while we're talking about Jonathan Haidt's work is, is purity versus degradation. Um, conservatives are more likely to cons consider uh, in evaluating what's appropriate behavior if things are pure and if <laughs> degrade them. Um, and so, so what does this look like? I, this, is, this is my favorite example for this, uh, just be, uh, because it's so clear cut. Um, so conservatives, can, many conservatives consider the flag sacred. Um, and uh, we have the ability to say, we are trying to reach out to conservatives, or we have the ability to say, I just wanna make a point. Um, so the picture on the far right here is a good example of, of a way to maybe push someone's button intentionally even, if they think that the flag is sacred. You know, use it as part of a costume to say America is there to, you know, with, our, with, a, with a, a match ready to blow up the world, and, that, uh, and, and use the, the flag as part of a costume where you're, you're saying, um, you know, making a negative statement there, not using it as someone that considers the flag sacred would, would use it. And the alternative on the left is, a, is an actual march for science um, where some people took took uh, did not hear my talk. This is I, I found the slide the first time I did it before the first af after the slide picture was taken. I created this talk, uh, but they they thought through how would we communicate to people um, that consider the flag sacred, and they put it on a pole and had it at the front of their march. Um, it's a it's a great signal and a great a great message to to say uh, to to send some messaging around. Um, and, and as you can see from the sign right behind it, science trumps alternate facts. This is not necessarily just a group full of uh, conservatives that are there uh, from the far right. Um, this is a march for science. So some ad additional, there are many things that we consider that, that uh, people consider pure and sacred. Parts of our history, uh, you, you can get very tripped up on this. If, um, as, as you can bump into issues, American history, um, uh, people from America, farther back in American history, uh, as well as um, religious references. Um, so if you share a faith tradition with somebody else, you can share parts from that faith tradition. There's a, there's a couple of links that you can explore, Evangelicals Environmental Network, uh, Mitch Hescock's group, uh, as well as Young Evangelicals for Climate Action have some good material. I would put both of those groups in the rather progressive, uh, but they are evangelical Christians and they have some solid messaging from within that group uh, that relates very well to purity uh, from an from a evangelical perspective. Catherine Hayhoe does have some wonderful material on this. Um, there's also a Citizens Climate Radio 
um, as well as, as you know, finding biblical verses um, or, or similar pieces within the Mormon uh, faith tradition or other faith traditions um, if you are reaching out to conservatives with, with, uh, with different backgrounds, different faith traditions. So this is, this is, I think, where I'm going to leave it with Jonathan Haidt, but uh, really just stress coming back to, say, as, as, you're, as you're preparing a presentation or a talk, or even as you find yourself talking, look for the ways in your conversation uh, where you can support the idea that authority, purity, and in-group loyalty are appropriate values for somebody to consider um, when they're evaluating what's acceptable behavior. As, as, as well as look for ways where you may throw out examples that, that uh, push somebody's button that considers authority, purity, and group loyalty. And when you're relying on the harm and fairness uh, arguments, which are still appropriate arguments to make, if you can cross-link them with a, a, an in-group loyalty conversation um, or other, other values at the same time, um, that can strengthen your argument a lot more than just making it all about is, is it fair uh, that, that uh, is it, it making it the arguments more about fairness. Uh, but I want to relate this more specifically over to the bill and, and kind of concrete uh, messaging you might be facing right now as you're talking about HR 763 uh, with, with people in your, in your community. So just a first point, the five messaging points that CCL has uh, put forward are, are designed to be effective uh, on both sides of the aisle. Um, that, it's, that our policy is effective at reducing emissions, that it's good for people, um, it improves the health, there's co-benefits for health, as well as giving the money back to people helps, helps people uh, deal with the increased costs. It's good for the economy, it creates jobs, it's bipartisan, we're really holding that together and it's revenue neutral. All these speaking points are good places to start. Um, but I wanna expand on it just a little bit to, to offer a little bit more than that. If, if you are not familiar with The Economist's um, statement on carbon dividends, I really encourage you to look up uh, this, this piece that, that uh, was published as a, uh, in the Wall Street Journal um, in, on January 17th. It's also available as a one-page PDF uh, from the Climate Leadership Council. Um, it has four or five points that, are, that, it, the, that 40 leading economists signed on to to publish it in the Wall Street Journal. And the points that they bring up are 100% consistent with our policy. Um, so while Climate Leadership Council and CCL have two different policy positions that we're working with, um, the economist statement on carbon dividends that the Climate Leadership Council coordinated describes their policy, but it also describes our policy perfectly. It does not include a liability uh, a waiver. Um, it, if you read it, there's nothing in there that contradicts our policy, and it is a great place to start a discussion with a conservative um, because of the, the economists they brought on board. Um, so these 40 leading economists include 15 chair of the president's council of economic advisors. That's a mouthful. And as you expect, those 15 uh, include the, the, the chairs that were brought uh, to the position and served under President Obama and Clinton. That might be expected, but it also includes the chairs that Presidents Ford, President Reagan, President George H.W. Bush, and President George W. Bush all appointed to those positions and had advised them. These people have now signed on to this policy saying this is what ha needs to happen. Global chain, climate change is a serious problem calling for immediate action, national action guided by sound economic principles, and here's, here's a nice laid out description that they've signed off on on a carbon fee and dividend plan. So if you're speaking to conservative audiences, um, I've actually rearranged a slide deck where this is the first thing I present uh, when I go into a conservative audience, and then I explain how our bill is consistent with this and what, what uh, additional, as you flush this out into a 40-page bill as opposed to a one-page statement, you add details, so I explain the details that go behind it. In addition, you can bring up conservative, the, the conservative uh, tradition of conserving. There are a lot of great examples of Republicans doing positive things on the environment that you can bring into your talk, and I'd, I'd encourage you uh, to become familiar with them. Um, and and uh, feel free to, there's a, there's a link for quotes down here. 
Um, if, oops, sorry, if you are not familiar with the work that um, Ronald Reagan did on the Montreal Protocol, um, I would really suggest you become familiar with that if you're going to talk to conservatives because it's a, a perfect example of an international agreement um, to solve a, national, a global climate change in chemistry that was affecting us, uh, where President Reagan listened to the scientists and went forward and negotiated with the countries around the world a treaty that we still hold up as a model of what we can do today. And in that link for quotes, uh, Margaret Thatcher, the Iron Lady in, in, uh, in uh, the UK, who was a chemist uh, by training and really understood climate change. And there's some wonderful quotes from uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher uh, in there also, where she articulated very clearly what the issue was a long time ago. Another angle to take when you're talking to conservatives that I use frequently is about personal responsibility and framing the entire discussion of climate change about me wanting to be personally responsible and us collectively wanting to be personally responsible. And I will frequently pull it into a national debt conversation of, of, of making the parallel discussion that I don't think it's, it's okay for us to be spending money that we're, that we're not covering today, where we're just putting it onto our kids and the, the same value holds here that I don't think it's fair or okay for it to be free for me to dispose of my trash into the air at no cost, um, or for anybody else to be able to dispose of their trash into the air when it's affecting other people, um, and just passing the expenses on to our kids. Um, so making these personal responsibility, uh, making this issue of personal responsibility, and really not making any reference to our use of energy as being bad. I, I, usually try and point out that I think our use of energy is good. It is the only way that you are listening to me tonight. I am, I am powered in North Carolina, where right now I am powered by a coal-fired power plant that's gonna switch over to natural gas. Um, if, they, if we were not emitting CO2, you would not be listening to me tonight. I would not have these lights on. I would not have had a cooked meal tonight. Um, I would not have been able to drive into the store to get groceries. And uh, I think there's the final point on describing the dividend. So, uh, just one final point as, as we're looking at how we describe HR 763 and the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividends Act and, and carbon dividend, dividends in general. Um, we often talk about the value of giving the money back equally to people, being that um, people the lower income brackets get more money back, um, then they're going to see an increased cost. And this fairness quotient is what we really rely on here. And it's even progressive. Uh, we use that from a tax perspective um, of saying, hey, this is progressive. People at the lower end and income brackets are going to make money. Um, and the fairness argument is, is really appropriate for conservatives. But this messaging, I really advise you to be careful around. Um, and um, the angle I take on describing the dividend, and even if somebody asks me, how is this going to affect lower income people, I do not start with, they're going to be okay because the, the dividend, uh, they're going to get back more money than, than they're going to see an increased cost. I start back just a step and say, with an equal dividend, people will make their own choices. And people who choose to emit less will make out. They'll get back more money than they see an increased cost. People that choose to emit less will get back more money than they see an increased cost. Today, when you look at people with lower income brackets, they typically emit less because they don't get on a jet plane as often. They don't have as big of a house. They don't have multiple cars. They don't take vacations at the same rate. They don't consume as many material goods. And so the, 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 all the modeling shows that people in those lower income brackets are going to get back more money than they see an increased cost because of the choices they make. And so they're not going to get harmed by this. So you can get to that as fair and they're not going to get harmed uh, while layering on a personal choice, personal responsibility layer. And, and the reason I bring this up is because there are a number of conservatives conservatives that I've seen push back saying, this is just an income redistribution plan. That's what this says. You guys want, like, this is a step into universal incomes and making it about personal choice and the consequences of our choices and framing it that way can help um, when you're speaking to conservatives, help allow them to hear uh, that this is a, a program that they, that they're, that's consistent with their values, with how they consider what's appropriate behavior. All right. So I've kind of 
Oh, I got one more, sorry. So we also have this phrase, uh, th this is a getting a nitpicky point. We have a phrase that the policy creates 2.1 million additional jobs over the next 10 years in the clean energy economy. And I've heard people say this multiple ways where I, where I feel it's uh, uh, important to bring it up. I usually stay away from the phrase clean energy economy. Really, it's just in our economy, their economy is gonna grow. We're gonna have uh, different sources of power. It, it, it will, the energy mix is gonna fix over to clean energy. Um, but the jobs that it's creating, as if, if as you may know, if you've studied the Remy report, are in areas like healthcare, um, consumer goods are are the biggest areas where there's new jobs. Um, and the ten, the this 2.1 million jobs is not 2.1 million people out there installing uh, solar panels and uh, in, increasing insulation in people's houses. Um, so it's really important not when you're speaking to conservatives in particular not to confuse. Um, the clean energy economy in that statement with jobs and clean energy, uh, because there will be more jobs in clean energy, but not 2.1 million more jobs in clean energy than you're gonna see losses from other sectors. Uh, the, the, but the stimulus effect of giving the money back to people and, let, and letting them go spend it is what is, is, is really the driver of this, uh, of this increase in jobs. So, so um, I, I bring this up because I just, I, uh, I, 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 I've seen people get called on it and, and kind of uh, not, not deal with getting called on it very well when people say, I don't really believe there's 2.1 million new jobs in, in clean energy that are going to get created. So with that, I, I want to close by just saying, as you're, if you're creating a talk, the more conservative you think your, your audience is, if you're going out and, and giving an aud talking to an audience where you, one of your goals is really to speak to conservatives, if you can insert some of these ideas, I encourage you to, and then I, I really encourage you to pull back everything that doesn't relate to your audience. So, so the ch chamber, I just said I'd spoke to our local chamber, I, I removed everything in the talk that not, did not relate to businesses or jobs in Asheville, North Carolina or Buncombe County. Um, I did not talk about carbon tax policy in other countries or in Canada. Um, if, it, if I could not relate it to jobs and company, the health of companies in Asheville, North Carolina, um, I did not bring it in. Uh, so my analogy here is a nice pretty picture of a cat that's, you know, kind of cute. He's walking and getting his, his paws rather wet. And what I want to help, encourage you to avoid is thinking if you just drop a slide in, that you're fine, then you've covered conservatives because you had a slide that was conservative friendly. If this was a talk of that I wanted to appeal to cat lovers, and I included my old slide deck and said, I put my drop-in slides for talking to conservatives, it would not really be appealing to conservatives. Um, it would be appealing to dog lovers. Um, and I'm not trying to say what animal represents what, but my point here is to really to the drop and slides are nice, but what you really want to do is look at the content of your talk and evaluating it if it's speaking to the audience you're presenting to. And if there are parts that are not speaking to the audience you're presenting to, just cut them out. Um, that, that the goal is to connect with your audience and connect with the values your audience has. Um, when, when you're, when you're, especially when you're thinking about speaking to, to really to any audience. What I'd like to do now is, is um, so I've, I've thrown a lot on the table, um, and what I'd like to do is do a breakout session where I'm going to I'm going to combine you each in groups of two and just talk for um, let's say four minutes on um, like of the ideas that you heard tonight. What do you think you could add to your talks or pull out of your talks if you're ta if you know you're talking to a conservative audience? Yeah, thanks so much, Jim. Well, to wrap up, let's make sure you do a quick review of where to find and connect with the Conservative Caucus on CCL Community. You can see here on the screen that we've highlighted the Connect with Others button, the main menu item, rather, of uh, the main community. And then once you click on that, click on the Action Team directory option in the drop-down tab, and then from there, click on the Conservative Caucus link. When in there, you can see there's a couple of wonderful ways to participate. First and foremost, you can click on the forums button on the left-hand side there that Jim has created an arrow to. And from there, you can ask any questions you might have of the Conservative Caucus volunteers and CCL leaders around the country. You'll see what the discussion features of late around conservative topics. 
You can also see on the home page that there's a more info tab that Jim has highlighted here, a box on the right hand side. And from there, all of those resources are available, including this first one, which Jim has spotlighted as the conservative outreach ideas in the list of ways that you can reach out in your local community. As a quick review, the three points that we hope that you've really been able to experience tonight is understanding that conservatives and liberals rely on different values when evaluating what is acceptable behavior and to really be able to use that understanding in your own successful presentations and conversations that focus more on the audience's values and meet them wherever they might be at to bring them closer in dialogue on the important issue of climate change. And lastly, we really hope that this review has also highlighted some resources that you can use in your own leverage and outreach to conservatives within CCL community. A reminder that Core Volunteer Training is a program available every week, and if you're interested, you can go on community to see what the upcoming resources are, as well as check out the most recent versions of past lessons. And we'd love to just close tonight by thanking Jim for his excellent leadership Here's Jim's contact information, james.tolbert at citizensclimate.org, as well as a link to the Energy Innovation Act forum. If you have any questions, we'd love to help support you and all ahead. Thank you so much for your time. We hope that you found tonight's webinar useful, and we look forward to working together in our important outreach in all ahead.